posting it on the yeah. on the live. So we've de- Philippe, we've decided on our Sunday night phone call tonight to talk about linguistics, linguistics mm-hmm. and the brain. We've decided yep. to potentially do a secret handshake, right? Digitally, I don't know how we pull <laughs> that off. And we've also decided this. We've decided <laughs> like that side. the side of the cross, right? Catholics are like, that's great. I appreciate that handshake. Right. Um, and um, we've also decided that if and when I move to Europe, that you're coming to visit me in Switzerland. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's all absolutely. Switzerland is great for the brain, I've heard. I right, listen. I, I'm sure it is. You know, they don't take sides. No right, exactly. It's completely <laughs> neutral. Well played, my right. friend. Well played. That's right. No, no peer pressure. They're like, no, no. We're just, good. We're, we're in the middle. You know we're what? Neutral. We're what's the Buddhist brain here? We're just neutral. That's what we do. Got it. The, That's mi- right. yeah. the middle path that the brain probably <laughs> is good. Okay, things that I wanted to talk about today, and we will at the end of our conversation. I do want to jump into your site. I want to look at the Inlay Brain Fit Institute so people can see what it is, so you can brag on yourself and your T-shirt. Um, but I want to get into why Steven Pinker should be my best friend. And those of you who don't know Steven Pinker, look him up. <laughs> I was watching some terrific. He, he's is he a neuro Ling- linguist? I mean, is that his job? I mean, I know he's a Harvard professor, but if walk me through, like anyone watching this, please Google Steven Pinker, brain, neurology, n- neurolinguistics. He is just such an exceptional speaker. He's a great communicator. So when, I, when we were talking about what to talk about tonight, I said, I was like, I want to talk about neurolinguistics. Both of these words, I know what they kind of mean separately, but I would love to understand from a neurologist, what is neurolinguistics? What does that mean? Yeah, I think, so first of all, Steven Pinker is a psychologist. He's a psychologist, okay. He's a psychologist, yeah, but he specializes in how we communicate. Okay. Okay, So linguistics is the study of communication. And neurolinguistics is really about how language and the brain, uh, interact right and and, yeah. and where in the brain sort of language localizes to okay um, so as don't as, ask me because i have no clue well look as, as a neurologist we see often language being impaired yeah by people who have some kind of injury to their brain whether it's a stroke a brain tumor and so when language gets impaired so language refers to to different things, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not just your ability to speak, mm-hmm. but it's also your ability to understand what is being said to you. And your ability to speak and communicate and express yourself involves a different area of your brain than your ability to understand language, your ability to comprehend language. And so what we'll often see is if somebody has a stroke affecting a part of their brain, especially in the left frontal lobe, right? that that will impact their ability to speak, to express themselves. Mm. If somebody has a stroke uh, impacting their left temporal lobe, that can impact their ability to understand language. Okay. So say, <laughs> say, that, say that again, because I don't know if my left temporal lobe qu- quite captured yeah. it. So let's say this, right? So most people are going to be dominant for language on the left side of their brain, meaning that the left side of your brain is where language is sort of stored, right? Okay. Uh, And so as a neurologist and as an epilepsy specialist, a lot of times when I'm preparing people for potential epilepsy surgery, we want to make sure where language is dominant or if they've got a co-dominance. Is language on the left side of the brain? Is it on the right side of the brain? Or is it sort of mixed up on both sides of the brain? Wow. Most people will be dominant for language on the left side of the brain. And the way that we test that is actually we take them to like a kind of like an operating room. Mm-hmm. We put half of their brain to sleep. So we'll put the right side of their brain to sleep. And then we'll test the left side of their brain for language wow. and for memory. Right? Wow. Then we'll see how they do. Then we'll wake up the you know the side of the brain that we put to sleep Mm -hmm. we'll wake it up we'll let them sort of go back to to normal and then about half an hour 45 minutes later we'll put the opposite side of their brain to sleep and start testing that side of the brain right okay and so most people are going to be dominant for language on the left side of their brain and the inferior frontal lobe is where expressive language 
tends to be housed. You know what I'm going to ask. What the heck is the inferior frontal lobe? I love that you say these things. You're like, Adam, you know, the inferior frontal lobe. I was like, why does it feel <laughs> inferior? Was it getting picked on in high school? Is it, is it like, no, no, it's just, does it it's have... The lower, it's just the lower part of the frontal lobe. Okay, right? okay. Um, so it's the inferior left frontal gyrus, the inferior left frontal lobe. Okay. okay? And then that's where expressive language is housed, so your ability to, to speak and express yourself and communicate that way. Okay. Where your superior temporal lobe, right above your ear mm -hmm. on the left uh -huh. side, uh -huh. that is where your ability to understand language tends to be housed, right? Hmm. And so if somebody has like a stroke, did you see um, uh, Ron Paul the other day? You, so I didn't see it, but I've now heard, I really should watch it, but I've, I've heard about it now for the past couple of days. Yeah, so Ron Paul had a stroke-like event um, while he was doing, I don't know if it was Instagram Live or some, some live uh, streaming thing. Sure. And while he is speaking, you can see that actually the left side of his face starts to droop. Okay. And he starts having difficulty expressing himself, right? Yes. And so a lot of times when somebody has a stroke, they'll have difficulty speaking depending on where the stroke is, hmm. what part of the brain the stroke is impacting. Hmm. Okay? So it's not 100% that he had a stroke. They didn't come out and say what he had. You could have had like a, he could have had like a transient ischemic attack, which some people consider a mini stroke, but then got better within minutes or hours. Um, but yeah, but so not only did his face go weak, but he had some language issues. Right. Yeah. And so sometimes when people have language issues, we call that an aphasia. Aphasia. Okay. I've when heard. I, I've heard to, this word before. I've heard aphasia. When it's related to something going wrong in the brain, we call it an aphasia. Okay. 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 If somebody knows exactly what they want to say, but they can't get their words out. Sorry. Keep going, dude. This happened to me. <laughs> That's an expressive aphasia, Ooh. and most of the time, that's going to be due to uh, an issue in their left frontal lobe, in their left frontal gyrus. So you're right? saying when you put the right side of it to sleep, and you're testing, I mean, is this the, and we, how do you put the right side of your brain to sleep? I mean, I'm picturing everything from young Frankenstein, you know, yeah. with Gene Wilder cutting a skull off and actually putting something to sleep with like a, you know, a choke holder. I'm, I'm of course I'm joking, but right. <laughs> how do you put a, how do you put half of someone's brain to sleep in actually? You inject um, that part of their brain with a medication. Skull still on or you have to remove part of the skull? Oh, no, no, no. You can. Uh, so what the uh, surgeons will do is that they will run um, sort of like a wire up their, their, uh, veins and arteries in the leg all the way up Whoa. and then inject that part of their their Ooh. brain and put it to sleep hey look 2020 crazy year the fact that we can do that is almost makes it worth it it's you know that's incredible <laughs> i just well, don't this is way before 20 i know but that's what i'm saying we are taking this for granted i mean that's incredible that we can run something through a groin surgery essentially out, up through into your brain and put it's incredible it's, it's okay so you're putting half of the brain to sleep you then test this non-inferior part of your thing above your ear your what, what is this temporal gyrus. superior temporal gyrus it was on the tip of my tongue superior yep. temporal gyrus here and then my inferior frontal lobe yep and now if it lights up a hundred percent you're good, and the, you can work here. What if it's like, uh-oh, the right side has some stuff going on, and where would that be, if that's yeah, the so case? Yeah, so look, so if, I, if I'm putting the right side of the brain to sleep, it's mm. to test the, um, the left side, Correct. right? Right. So if then if I'm, if I'm showing them pictures and ask them to tell me what it is, or I'm having conversations with them, and they are responding just fine, then I know that, look, the left side of the brain um, that's where language is, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when I reverse it, and now I put the left side of the brain to sleep, if I if the left side of the brain is what's going to be dominant for language, I would expect that the right side of the brain, either there's not really going to be language there, so when I'm testing them, they're not going to be able to speak or remember, wow. yeah. right? Yeah. Because there's not going to be language or memory there. Or maybe there's a little bit of language and a little bit of memory, but it's not as strong as on the left side of the brain. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, I'm, I'm like, I get, this is blowing me away sometimes. So, so, so it's like, you know, so let's say I'm going to show them like 10 cards. Yes. Right? Of 10 cards of different animals. And, and I'm like, okay, so the right side of the brain is asleep. I'm like, name the 10, 10 cards for me. And they yeah. name all 10 correctly. Right. So the right side of the brain is completely asleep, right? Totally asleep. Right. 45 minutes later, I put the left brain to sleep. The white, the right side of the brain is awake and show them 10 different cards. Ask them to name it. Let's say they name only two out of the ten, right? Yeah. Then I know that, look, wow. the left side is where dominant is, tends to be more dominant for language. But if you ask them, how many sheep am I holding up? They could count it, <laughs> right? Because the right side is the name. Okay, so, so now that we can know that the language exists really in yeah. this some gyra, something, spirogyra, and the inferior um, pre... I almost said inf I almost said inferior prenatal something. Well, I think that's because uh, you, you're thinking about the. Uh, I'm your thinking brain on birth your brain on birth other project. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so now that we know that that lives there, like, what does our brain think of language? What is what actually happens with a word? Um, does it like certain language over other language? Is language just neutral? Um, you know. What what is what does how does language appear in the brain? I know you can watch it. Yeah. You can say here, and I can watch it. But as a neurologist, you know, when I think of language in the brain, it's different than how does a neurologist think of language in the brain? So, so here's the interesting thing about language, right? So, human beings and probably other animals too are um, very hardwired to communicate, right? And you yeah. can see this in babies, right? Babies will sort of babble very early on right mm -hmm. yeah um you don't really have to teach babies how to speak their first language that's yeah, steven pinker brings this up he's right. like it's the reason that you don't explain some a baby language but you have to tell them how to tie their shoe or some other activity right yeah or, yeah. yeah you know but they're able to sort of pick it up wow um and so and and like i said this probably occurs in other animals too uh i don't know if we're unique mm. in terms of this right i'm sure Whales have very complicated language yeah, right, through their true. sort of clicks and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it does. It, it, it's incredibly interesting to see that. And so we can study language. And so when we do like uh, an fMRI, a functional uh, MRI, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And we're looking to see how the brain is sort of taking up, how the brain is using energy. So how it's taking up blood and glucose. Mm -hmm. um, if you present a stimulus like a word or a sentence, mm. you can see which area of the brain lights up. Wow. That, right? And so mm. that tells you over time, you do enough people and you say, well, oh, they all sort of lit up in this particular part of the brain. Wow. So then you can say, oh, this part of the brain must be where language is sort of stored. Although, like we always talk about, this stuff is very interconnected, right? So I can say, look, right. The left temporal, uh, the left inferior temporal lobe, and the left superior temporal gyrus. That's where you've got ex uh, expressive and receptive language. Yeah. Uh, but they're connected by a bundle of fibers called your arcuate fasciculus. Um, let's not pretend like language um, emotions don't play a significant role in language because they yeah. definitely do. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, and let's not pretend like we don't have other ways of communicating either through uh, signs that we do, right? And even uh, people who are born without hearing, mm. right? Even if you don't put them through some formal sign language class, they'll learn to communicate their needs through sign. Yeah. Okay? Um, right, and obviously we communicate through visual cues all the time. Oh yeah. I, so this, this oh, is yeah. all really complicated yeah. stuff. Language is complicated, right? And yeah. it involves multiple different areas of your brain. Mm. Uh, but when we think about it, we say, in general, language tends to be dominant for most people on the left side. And these two areas, your inferior frontal lobe and your superior temporal gyrus, play a really critical role in language. Okay. So now follow up to that, right? Yeah. Is, so say I'm, I'm using uh, I'm, the cerebellum is my balance uh, area, right? Cerebellum plays a role in, in, in balance, motor, motor function. Yeah. Okay, so I'm an athlete. I'm going to yep. be a good athlete. My cerebellum is working hard. 
yeah. <laughs> neurology wise. Now I say to myself, I want other parts of my brain to go to the cerebellum after work, after it's move, moving and say, Hey, great job today. You did a good job of moving us around. Let's looking forward to tomorrow. What are some, is there, can you watch like certain language that, I don't know, supports the cerebellum? I mean, it sounds a little far-fetched, but does that no, like, sorry. does that, so in other words, so that tomorrow morning I'm, my cerebellum is like, I did do a good job today. I'm going to go back to work and, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, you know, here's the interesting thing, right? So I'll say, look, you know, most people say, look, language is really in this part of the brain. And I just said, look, let's not pretend like this whole system is not complicated Connected. and yeah. it involves different areas. One of the things that we do know is is speech is affected by the cerebellum, right? And so we can see it. Um, hmm. People, when they have cerebellar injuries, they'll have what appears to be language issues as well. Hmm. Um, and in fact, if you like manipulate the middle part of the cerebellum, like Wait, during surgery. Where's the right? cerebellum? It's like, it's basically it's like, like the lower. Yeah, it's sort of uh, towards the base. Okay. If during surgery you manipulate the middle part of the cerebellum, mm -hmm. you can actually cause somebody to become mute. Become mute. Mute. Wow. I think everybody uh, like dealing with politics right now is just like, I want that. I need that <laughs> in my life for people. Yeah. <laughs> wow. um, so it, it's like the entire brain is involved. Even when we say, look, this particular part of the brain does this, this part of the brain does that. But it's yeah. a really complicated. Um, system. And so hmm. when I see people that have had strokes, right, if somebody has a stroke of the uh, in, impacting their frontal lobe, and now they have an expressive aphasia, meaning that they know what they want to say, but they have trouble getting it out, right? right? Their, right. their speech is slow, they have trouble finding the words, maybe the grammar is not correct. Maybe they're, you know, they're able to get one or two words out to get their point across. But in their but brain, it, they see it. They know they want to say they, it. They're they just like, exactly oh, my God, I can't. It. It's not coming out the way they I just can't express it. Right. They know exactly what they want to say. Right? Scary. It's scary. So you can imagine from their perspective, that's very, very frustrating. Very frustrating. Right. right. Now, somebody with a receptive aphasia, meaning that they can speak, they can express themselves. They just don't understand what you're saying to them. Okay. Okay. So and what was the first one? Receptive aphasia is understand. So the what first one is the first one's an expressive expressive aphasia. aphasia. That's okay. your that's your frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. The second one is a receptive aphasia. That's your superior temporal gyrus. Yes. And that um, is about the you know that impacts your ability to understand language. Okay. If somebody has a stroke in that particular part of the brain, right? Then they're able to express themselves, but when you're talking with them, it's like they're having a completely different conversation. Yeah. And even though the sentence structure kind of makes sense, it just the conversation just does not make sense at all, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it'll be like, you know, you're like, hey, how's your day going? And they'll be like, oh, you know, uh, Namu was the first whale at SeaWorld, and Shamu really means friend of Namu, and you're, you're just like, wait, what? <laughs> right, right. That's not what I asked you. Right, exactly. You can imagine hmm. how, if that conversation continues to go, that would be frustrating for you. Yeah. Just trying to engage them, wow, right? Wow, wow. So what I, what I often tell uh, my students, residents, nurses, or even you know new doctors I may be working with, mm. When you're trying to tease out a receptive aphasia, so your superior temporal gyrus, which yes. you know, impacts your ability to understand, versus That's an expressive right. aphasia. Right up here. My inferior the, frontal lobe. Right. One of the key things is it's your emotion. How are you hmm. what's the what's the the emotional context in the moment? Hmm. Who's getting frustrated? Is it the patient getting frustrated because they can't express themselves? Ooh. Or is it the getting frustrated? They're not understanding you. Right. They're having a completely okay. different conversation from you because that will help you figure out what the diagnosis is. Even before looking and seeing what lights up or not, right? Listen, as, as a neurologist, in theory, you should never need MRIs, CAT scans, EEGs. Those things should help you confirm. Right. But you should be able to localize what parts of the brain are affected just based on your examination of the person, 
in this in this particular situation, we're talking about neurolinguistics. So in the conversations yes. you're having with the person and, and their ability to communicate. How do you find, so you just said an interesting one about linguistics and questioning. What, what kind of questions um, does the brain either like or not like or... I mean, what, what things in language, when asked, assuming there's no aphasias, someone asks me a question, I'm usually, I mean, it could be whether it's someone I know or don't know, some of those questions are like, oh yeah, like I want to answer them, or sometimes I, uh, they're turning me off. I mean, I get that it's individualized, but are there any broad strokes about brains like these types of questions or something, or this type of language? Look, I, I, I talk about this in my course. Questions are incredibly powerful, mm. right? And there's no such thing as a bad question. Mm. But the best questions are going to be the ones that elicit a lot of new information. Yeah. And so what your brain likes is for you to take off the limits and allow it to kind of explore and get creative and think about things in a completely different way, right? Yeah. And so even when we're sort of doing the self-talk, you know, I often tell people that instead of like telling yourself, oh, I have to do this, it might be better to say something like, how can I do this better? Ask your brain the hmm. question because then your brain, you know, we, I think we've said this before, your brain is always seeking the truth and it is always looking to prove you're right. Yeah. When you yeah. ask a really powerful question to your brain, it's going to be seeking out a whole bunch of different answers, right? And so instead of being like, man, I can't afford that, it's like, well, how can I afford that? And your brain will just open up the floodgates. So I'm, I'm literally writing this down. I'm actually yeah. like taking notes on what questions to ask my brain. And look, and, and this goes back to, you know, the conversation wow. we had last powerful, week about powerful uh, stuff. the brain and wealth, right? You see a lot of people uh, that have negative associations when it comes to money like we talked about last week. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what are they always saying? They're always saying, oh, I can't afford this. I can't afford that. That's too expensive. Right. Instead of saying that, because then you close your brain off and your brain will prove you're right. It'll be like, oh, yeah, look, yeah, you know, your, your bank account has nothing in it. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, right. But instead, instead being like, well, how can I afford this? I like the I like what you said about I think that's key. Help take the limits off of your brain, right? Your br like this is it's almost interesting. It's both scary and fun, right? Like yeah. I'm a relative. I've just had this realization. I'll share candidly. I think I'm relatively safe. Like I'm not skydiving. I'm not. You know what I mean? I, I I've done it, but I'm like almost uh, safe. And then I'll take a risk, you know, a calculating risk type person. Whereas my brain, and I'm always trying to get, like you say, take control of your, be, be the leader your brain needs you to be, right? The job of leadership on some level in my head looks like guardrails. Like, don't go crazy brain. I know, you know, if when you're running off and going crazy, I'm either depressed, stressed, anxious, you know, insert whatever, confused. Now there's almost another part of this that's like, take off the rails, go create, like, let it go, let it go and yeah. surf the wave of your brain here. Let it really be creative. So it's almost like, I don't want to say they're at odds, but there's two parts to that. I mean, well, well, I would say that, so you're looking at it from the brain's perspective of the brain being in control. And I'm saying, no, you, the fact that you're able to be aware of your brain, that you're able to be aware of your thoughts, it's mm. just that there's a much higher level of consciousness. Of mind that you are, whatever you, you are not call your it. brain. That's right. right? You are not your brain. And so it's taking off the guardrails off of you so you can become the leader and tell your brain. Oh, so they are related. what you okay. need to do. So guardrails off, but I'm, I'm letting it fly. Become like Neo from The Matrix, right? He gets yeah, to ingest much. all of See, we should have led with that. Become Neo. Yeah, for, that's yeah, going to be the title. Just, I mean, it's it's the exact same thing, right? I mean, you're programmed to think about things in a certain way. Yeah. Just like computers are, just like they were in the Matrix, right? Yeah. All right. This is great. Wait, wait. Keep going. Keep going. No, and what everybody's really searching for at the end of the day is freedom. Freedom and love. Freedom from the, freedom from the programs that we've been given. Yeah. I love it. I love it. All right. Let freedom is a good uh, time to pivot because I want to cover some inlay brain fit Institute stuff. And I also want to use my cool tool here yeah. of screen sharing. <laughs> well, so you yeah. can, you can't see this, but I'm on your homepage. 
Um, okay. I have your good looking mug up to my whatever. I mean, actually, you're right. My le- whatever. It's behind me. Um, and so just like this is your site, as everybody can see. But like, tell me where to go. Like, what, what's what's the take charge of your brain uh, in 30 days? Like, yeah, what's so what's going on? on? The, on the I'm on the homepage. You see where it says learn, learn more. Um, schedule a call. And then, like, in that take charge of your brain in 30 days, right underneath it, in a blue box, it says learn more. Hang on, hang like, on. Box. Yes, want me to click on that? Yeah, yeah I can. Yeah, yeah, click, click on, that. on that. I can actually kind of see it through your, your glasses. <laughs> ah, look at that. Hang on. Let me see if I can. Oh, there it is. Let's see if I can get to it. And so, look, and, and so this is really uh, the page for my online course, Take Charge of Your Brain in 30 Days. And when we talk about becoming the leader that your brain needs, this is what the my course is about. It's about becoming the leader that your brain needs and creating the extraordinary life life that you've always, always wanted. wanted. And, so and so when you when you, you kind of uh, scroll down, down right, and what you'll get in, in, in the first module, what we really focus on yeah. is helping people create a mission, vision, and purpose for their life. And we talk about how that impacts the way that their brains evolve. Yeah. Right? Um, in the second module, what we talk about is the, the impact that just everything, everything in your life has on your health, health. right? Uh, and how preventable chronic diseases impact your brain and your neurological health. health. And then in the third uh, module, we really focus on becoming the leader that your brain needs, teaching you about all the, the things that influence uh, the way that your brain evolves and teaching yeah. you about neurological disorders along the way as well. Yeah. And then the fourth module is really about creating your own prescription plan so that way you can become healthier you can create the life that you've always wanted based on developing yourself developing your mind your body and your soul yeah right? and so if you scroll down one of the things that i really uh, love we got, we got a video here um that you know you should definitely take a look at when you've got, when you've got time, time yeah like, like a minute, minute video but if you, but if you go down and see what some people are saying about the course i think it is it's really great you know, you like, know, like uh, uh, Jackie, Jackie here says, says, it's like, oh, there it is. I see. Like a patient, you, you don't feel like a patient anymore, right? right? And one of the things that, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, you've gone, you've to, gone a to a doctor's office, office right? Where, where sometimes, sometimes you can, you can feel rushed. rushed. You've, got you've got like 15, 15 20, 20 minutes. One of the, one of the things, things that's really interesting is mm-hmm. that research shows that the vast majority of people in this country are healthcare literate. Meaning, meaning that, that they, they don't understand, understand the diseases, diseases that, they that they have. They don't, they don't understand um, how, to get, how to get healthier and, mm-hmm. what, and what caused the diseases. diseases. And, then and then they don't understand the jargon that we use in the office. In the office right? Right? And, so and so when, when you combine all of that with the emotional toll of potentially seeing, seeing a doctor, having a, having a diagnosis, diagnosis, taking meds, people don't, people don't remember what you tell them like a week later. It's as if they didn't even show up. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so this course, course also helps you to meet people, people where they're at. They can go back and uh, they, they have access to all these 70, 70 plus lessons. lessons. They can, yeah. can go back and, 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 and you know, you know, take, take a look, a look um, and, refresh and refresh their memory. Their memory right? Right? And then, and then I, I, like I like what Marcus says here, here that um, the, approach the approach to gaining direction and purpose in one's life. life. Right? We, all we all need a reason to get up in the morning. And what research shows is that Somebody, somebody who's 80, 80 and 90, 90 with, a with a purpose does, does better, better cognitively than somebody, than somebody 80, 80, 90, 90 without, without a purpose. purpose. Yeah. You know? and, and I know from being 80 and 90, right, not me, obviously, personally, but I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of it is tied to your children. And when those children, you know, sometimes are doing their own purpose, you're like, wait, what's my purpose again? My kids don't maybe like need me as much. So I would imagine 80 and 90 becomes challenging because the thing that made you who you were up to this point is like yeah. removed from you a little bit, like kind of unwantingly. I mean, your your kids just don't need you in the same way that they needed you when you were younger, when they were younger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know, you know and, and you'll and see one of my, one of my you know, you know, sort of funny stories, stories from when I was when in, I was in private, private practice, practice, right, is that... that uh, uh, You'll see, You'll see a, a lot, lot of people bring yeah, their moms or dads over, over from a foreign country, country mm-hmm. to come and take yeah. care of, of their, their children, children their, 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 their grandchildren, grandchildren here, here, right? right? Yeah. Uh, uh, as in free babysitting. babysitting. And, their and their moms and, and, and dads, dads in their foreign country, country had their own lives, right? Their they had their own friends, friends they had their activities, they had a purpose there. And so, and they were doing well. 
then about, then about six, six months, months into being, being here and just being with their grandchildren, grandchildren they'll, they'll start developing some cognitive issues. issues. Yeah, and, and you now said this, yeah. The family's concerned, right, right that they're, they're developing dementia. dementia. And, I'll be, and like, I'll be like, what, what do we spend, spend their days doing, doing now? now? Oh, just, oh, just, just, just being with the grandkids. Right, so they have, besides that, they have no real, real purpose, right? And so, and so when you say, well, they need more, more than just being, being with the grandkids, grandkids. They, they need, you know, you know to, be to be challenging, challenging themselves. themselves. They, need they need to be physically, physically active. active. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the responses, responses I'll sometimes, sometimes get is, well, well, we, well take, we, take, we, take we take her out, her out like once a week. And I'm, and like, I'm like, yeah, but, yeah, but you, you take your dog out twice a day. Right, 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 right. So, so, you know, people, people really need a reason, need a reason to, 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 to get up, get up and get out, get out yeah. and doing, doing things that are going to be uh, physically, physically stimulating to their body, body and their brains. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I want to go back. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and then I want to go back to the other thing. Oh, God. Okay, good. I'm going to stop sharing. And I think we may finish for today, but I want to, you know, who is this for? Because I was, I'd ask you questions in email. I yeah. don't see if I can pull up my email real quick, but because it's not for me necessarily, right? It's not because, so who, who is right. it really for and how can, what's a request you can make of, of the audience watching this? Yeah. So this is for people who have chronic medical and neurological issues. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that I often see is that when people have some chronic neurological or medical issue going on, their entire life starts to revolve around that particular diagnosis. Yeah. Right. And this is to help people move beyond that and know that they can have an extraordinary life despite whatever their diagnosis is. Right. 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 Despite their symptoms, they can improve their body uh, as well as their mind. So this is for people who, you know, have had strokes, who have Parkinson's, MS, who have high blood pressure, diabetes, low back pain, um, neuropathy, right? This yeah. is also for people who know that there is much more to health and wellness than just popping a pill. Yeah. That it really is about developing your mind, your body, and your soul. This is for people who want a different healthcare experience, who are tired of those 15, 20 minute rushed hospitals little visits right? mm -hmm. uh, who want to have access to a doctor a couple hours a week. And one of the things we didn't mention is that in this course, you have live group coaching sessions with, with myself, your own personal brain expert. It's great. Two hours per week. And while you, you know, the course says take charge of your brain in 30 days, you actually have access to the course for a full year. So two hours per week for a full year, eight hours per month for a full year. Eight mm -hmm. times 12 is 96 hours. It's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, where, where else are you going to get access to a doctor that like that? I don't think so. And that's like, this is just comes from your practice. You were like, I, I can't sit by and watch people not get this, right? I mean, this just came out of yeah. your heart, pretty much. Yeah, and, and this is not about me prescribing meds. I'm not prescribing meds. I'm not yeah. referring you to anyone. This is really about doing the work in terms of getting healthy. Yeah. And in terms of creating a really great life for yourself, it's not it's not easy, right? Because yeah. there's some accountability. Uh, you've got to be active in the process. This is not sort of passive. And I think a lot of med medicine tends to be a little passive. It's like you go to a doctor. Look, I, I tell a story of like, you know, there's plenty of times where we see people who have had surgery and you ask them, why did you have surgery? And they'll be like, oh, my doctor told me I needed it. And you're like, okay, I, but why? Yeah, right. I just, you I'm going to trust. They, they know. know. Yeah. Like, you, you let somebody cut into you and you yeah. don't know why. Yeah. So it's a very passive process. Right? I agree. Oh, that's really good. Make Making medicine more active, right? Especially for, yeah. or becoming, becoming the, become the leader your brain needs you to be so you could become the leader and the advocate your, for your own um, health. Absolutely. And, I, and in the course I talk about, be, you need to be your best advocate. Yeah. 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 You know? Because you are the expert on you. You are the expert on your body. Yeah. And so the way that I see it, whenever I see a patient, it is two experts coming together to figure out a way to get you that. healthier. I love that. All right. With that, um, we're going to end today on linguistics and, of course, the Inlay Brain Fit Institute. I will drop it all in the comments here down below. Um, we'll be back next week at our same bat time, same bat channel for something again. If you have any comments, if you're watching, if you have any things that you'd like to hear Philippe uh, talk about or me to ask, think of me as the guy who slept at the Holiday Inn Express. If you've seen those commercials where I'm just <laughs> a little bit 
better than the normal viewer, but only because I slept at the Holiday Inn Express. I'm not the expert. So I'm the expert in me. Um, but yeah. until next week, Philippe, I love it. Always a pleasure. Awesome. My my brain is taking the guardrails off of it. I'm going to have a very creative evening. And I wish you well. You too. Take care. Okay. All right.